crossway.org reports on Tuesday, January 3rd, 1956, Jim Elliott and four other missionaries landed on a small strip of land in the jungles of Ecuador. It was a dangerous landing and they could not all land at once. And for years they had been dreaming of and planning for this moment. Their hearts were set on reaching the Aka Indians with the good news of Jesus Christ. The Akas were a notoriously dangerous tribe and no one had reached them before. Some had exchanged gifts, but always the Akas had attacked them. And for three months, three months, this group of missionaries had been regularly flying over the area, dropping gifts and shouting greetings at this tribe. And when they landed, they built a hut and they waited for the Akas to come and find them. They all knew the danger. Their wives had discussed the possibility of becoming widows. Elizabeth Elliot, the wife of Jim Elliot says, they went simply because they knew they belonged to God, because he was their creator and their redeemer. They had no choice but to willingly obey him. And that meant obeying his command to take the good news to every nation. Jim Elliot said, oh, the fullness pleasure, sheer excitement of knowing God on earth. I care not if I never raise my voice again for him, if only I may love him and please him. On Friday, January 6, three Akas, one man and two women approached them. They exchanged greetings. The missionaries showed them rubber bands, yo-yos and balloons. And the man was taken up in the plane that had brought them. On Sunday, January 8th, they were due to radio in at 4.30 and there was silence. When no message came, a plane was sent and then a rescue party and four of their bodies were discovered, all lanced to death, meaning speared. The fifth was never found. It appears they had been ambushed. All five, all five of these men were martyred for the sake of Christ. All of them were married. Four of them were fathers. One's wife was pregnant. Her three-year-old was heard telling the new crying baby, never you mind, when we get to heaven, I'll show you which one is daddy. Aww. And Jim Elliott said in his writings that he left behind, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Mm -hmm. Who said it again? He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Isn't that powerful? Jim Elliott had seen through the lie of consumerism. He had seen the emptiness of all that this world offers and he had realized the far greater value of the new creation that God promises. Gill's exposition of the Bible explains, for what is a man profited? Such persons Though they're only seeking their own profit will find themselves most sadly mistaken for of what advantage will it be to such a man if he shall gain the whole world all that is precious and valuable in it all the power all the pleasures and riches of it if with alexander he had the government of the whole world and with solomon all the delights of it and was possessed with all of its wealth but lost his own soul if that should be consigned to everlasting torment and misery and be banished from the divine presence and continually feel the gnawings of the worm of conscience that never dies and the fierceness of the fire of God's wrath that will never be quenched, he will have made a miserable bargain. There's a few observations from Jim Elliott's testimony. One was that his journal looked very normal. It would look like anybody else's journal. It was doubtful that Jim Elliot expected anyone to ever read his notes. But they were a powerful testimony of his deep intimacy and his love for Jesus and his desire to see the kingdom of heaven built. And this also shows how deeply God loves and desires those even considered savage in the darkest of areas because that was the group these five amazing missionaries pursued were just what the world would consider just savages. We all seem to discount whether God will save pedophiles or serial murderers, even our own enemies, but God feels very differently about them than we do. 
And this story also clearly shows God can use ordinary people to impact the world in an extremely extraordinary way. Jim Elliott didn't write his famous quote for a book or for a sermon. He wrote it out of a deep love for Jesus Christ. And this deep love for Jesus should be our only ministry mission and motive, just like it was his. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in our hearts. Jim Elliot desired for the gospel to be preached, souls to be saved, and for God's word to be proclaimed with power. He desired to be one of those preachers of the gospel with the power to save souls. That was his mission, that souls would really be saved. And preaching the gospel and saving souls is exactly what he did, not in a way most create today with creative programs, processes, outreaches, but in God's way, which meant pouring out his life as a testimony of the gospel. His death ultimately led to the saving of the souls he longed to reach and made the writings of his journal able to be used by the Lord to preach with power the message that he himself had longed to preach. And the effort to reach the Aka Indians was not abandoned when all five of these missionaries were killed. Following the death of their husband and brother, Elizabeth Elliot and Rachel Saint quickly made a home among the Aka Indians. Rachel Saint worked for the Wycliffe Bible Translators and was the older sister of Nate, one of the missionaries killed with Jim Elliot. She was passionate about taking the gospel to an unreached tribe, especially the Aukas, and then translating the Bible into their language. The tragic event of her brother's death only intensified her passion to reach this tribe. Elizabeth Elliot, Jim's widow, returned to a nearby tribe with her younger daughter, Valerie, and made contact with two of the Aka women in Ecuador, in 1958, Rachel and Elizabeth were invited to live with the tribe. Rachel stayed with the Aka tribe until her death and was buried there. They experienced firsthand the Aka lifestyle and perfected their language skills. Nine years after the tragic event, the murder of the five missionaries, the Gospel of Mark was published in the Aka language. The pastor of the tribe, Kimo, who was one of the killers, was chosen to baptize Steve and Kathy Saint, Nate's children, the, one of the men that he murdered. God had used these women, a wife and a sister of the martyred missionaries to reconcile with the Aukas and to bring the tribe to salvation mm -hmm. in Jesus Christ. Mark 8 says in verse 34, and when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in glory of his Father and with the holy angels. The word soul is sometimes translated as life. And in this setting, Jesus is definitely talking about losing true spiritual life, which would be the loss of the soul. A soul is not lost as in misplaced, and it also never stops existing. To lose one's soul means the loss of spiritual well-being separated from God by sin in this life and ultimately separated from him eternally in the life to come. And this message um, that Jesus spoke challenged people that they have choices to make, big choices to make. Jesus calls on each person to deny himself and take up his cross in Mark 8, 34. He appeals to us to lose our life for the sake of the gospel in order to save our life in verse 35. And that simply means that he wants us to give up our devotion to ourselves and our own desires and count him and his will as being the most important. He further clearly states that he does not want us to be ashamed of him and his words in verse 38 
and this all shows that we have very important choices to make, very tough choices to make. These choices will determine our eternal destiny, heaven or hell. That's how important they are. These words of Jesus cause us to think soberly about what really matters most in our life and in our heart of hearts, just what is it that ranks way up at the top position of our life that is most important because he demands that it be the gospel. Jesus said to the rich young ruler that it's impossible to serve God and riches, which he called mammon. He exposed money as being that young man's idol and told him he could not enter heaven with that as his idol. There's a trap to catch wild monkeys. That trap consists of a hole inside a log where the hunter puts a, qual a large quantity of seeds. The monkey comes to the log, puts his hand through the hole, and grabs a handful of seeds. But he can't remove his hand as long as it's full of seeds. And so he sits there with his hand stuck in that hole in the log, and the hunter comes quickly to destroy him. Solomon's proverb warns us to behave rationally, avoiding violence and greed, which greed is considered violence. Greed is violence against the kingdom of God. Matthew 16 says in verse 24, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father and his angels, and then he will reward each one according to his works. Almost the same thing. In Matthew 16, Jesus asks, What good is it for a man to gain the whole world but to lose his soul? And to gain the whole world is to receive all that the world has to offer, money, fame, pleasure, power, prestige and to lose one soul is to die to literally die in this life without a right relationship with Jesus Christ and to spend eternity in a lake of fire as a result a true disciple of Jesus Christ is one that does follow him in purpose and will also follow him to heaven he is one that walks in the same way Jesus walked is led by his Holy Spirit walks in his steps wherever he goes and let him deny himself. If self-denial seems to be a hard expectation, it's what Jesus did. He did that to redeem us and to teach us. Jesus left heaven. He came as an infant, as a human being. He lived 33 years as a human being on this earth. And then he was murdered by human beings to make a way for us to be brought back into relationship with his father. That is complete self-denial. No one will ever come close to the sacrifice that Jesus made simply for us to have the opportunity. If any man will have the name and credit of a disciple of Jesus Christ, let him follow Christ in the work and duty of a disciple. Thousands lose their souls for very petty things, worthless indulgence, laziness, and negligence and for whatever reason men and women forsake Christ whatever it is that causes them to forsake him that is the price at which Satan buys their souls and one soul is worth more than the whole world to God and this is the judgment of Jesus on the matter he knew the price of souls for he redeemed them but he also didn't devalue the world because he created it. The dying sinner cannot purchase one hour of relief, one more hour of time to seek mercy for his perishing soul. And let us then learn to value our souls the way Jesus has before it's eternally too late. Most people do not get a choice to make it right when they have put it off. Barnes notes on the Bible says, for what is a man profited? To gain the whole world means to possess it as our own, all of its riches, its honors, and its pleasures. To lose his soul means to be cast away, to be shut out of heaven, and to be sent to hell. Two things are implied by Christ in these questions. One, 
that they are striving to gain the world and are unwilling to give it up for the sake of religion, they will lose their souls and too, that if the soul is lost, nothing can be given in exchange for it or that it can never be afterwards saved. There's no redemption from hell. The Matthew Poole commentary says, men will lose anything rather than their lives. What can be a more proportionable exchange or compensation to him for that? So now, if you value your temporary life at that rate, how much more should you value your eternal life and existence? Besides bodies, which can be killed by persecutors, you carry with you an immortal soul of infinitely more value, and besides a temporal life of which you are in possession, there is an eternal state which awaits every one of us. You are creatures ordained to an eternal existence, either in misery or in happiness, and admit you could by pleasing yourselves, denying Jesus, shifting the cross, declining a life according to his precepts and example, prolonging your temporal life, yet what will you get by it, considering that by it you must suffer loss as to your eternal happy existence? For Jesus says he will deny you before his Father and his angels. Can anything you get or save in this world be worth that exchange? And just before he asks, what good will it be if someone were to gain the whole world but forfeit their soul, Jesus says that in order to truly follow Christ, people must be willing to deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me, Matthew 16, 24. And to take up one's cross is a reference to being condemned to die. Jesus' statement is symbolic of a total and final commitment. One needs to be willing to give up everything in order to be a follower of Jesus Christ. The day of reckoning is coming for the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done, according to Matthew 16, 27. And there is nothing more valuable to God than a person's soul. And to trade that away is ultimate foolishness. When a person chooses to embrace this world instead of heaven, he's forfeiting his soul. And if a person rejects Christ for the sake of any other thing in this life, he will lose his soul. There are two ways to live, with God in Christ or against him. If with him, our Father will give us all things, according to Luke eleven thirteen, Jesus came that we would have life abundantly, John 10, 10. Surrender of our false, sinful self to him is the way to gain our true life in him. The temptation of Jesus in the desert was to gain the world if he forfeited his soul. That's what the enemy tried to get him to do in Matthew 4, 8. He could have avoided dying for all the sins of the world. He could have had the easy way, but he refused. His destiny, he knew, was to be exalted. And that every knee would bow to him and every tongue would confess his lordship. But first he had to leave his heavenly throne, give up his life, take up his cross and drink the cup that his father had given him to drink. And for those of us who follow Jesus on his way, we are expected to do the same. Whether it means martyrdom, laying down the life we thought we wanted or denying the impulses of our flesh, our own road involves a cross to bear every day. And we have to expect total surrender to God and his kingdom. And the cost only seems high until it's paid. But it is nothing in comparison to God becoming man and dying for us at the hands of sinful men. This was the example set by the one who deserves all, not part, all. He gave all. Once lost, there's nothing one can give in exchange for their lost soul. And while living, there is still opportunity. A soul can be bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. And if we would repent, which means turn from sin, not just say you're sorry for sin. Repent means turn from sin. Stop living for self and accept the free gift that comes from Jesus Christ. That is the only way to gain our own soul. It comes with the price of surrender, the false life, for the true life and for everything one has that is a treasure over Jesus. Often it is another person. I see more people trapped by relationships than any other thing. That will be the price for which you will pay to lose your soul.
There are three ways, according to Colin Smith, that a soul can be lost. One, you can starve your soul. Man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, according to Matthew 4.4. 4. Think about the rich man in Jesus' story in Luke 16. He lived well, he enjoyed life, he dressed in purple, royalty, and he never really thought about his soul. He only lived for this world. Bread sustains your body, the word of God sustains your soul. But this rich man had no taste for the word of God, no hunger for it, no appetite for the things of God. Jesus told another story about a man who lived the American dream. He worked hard, he stored up all he needed for a long retirement, and he said to himself, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years, so relax, eat, drink, and be merry. I'm going to enjoy myself, I've earned it. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. Luke 12, 19 to 20. So this would imply to those who are older, who have worked hard, that are enjoying their retirement, that have made their will, they've appointed their executor, they've thought about what will happen to all of their things, their accumulated things and finances when they are gone. But what about their soul? Why are they not urgently thinking about their soul? Why would you not go after something that urgent that's actually you passing into eternity when you make all of these tiny provisions for your things? Number two, you can strangle your soul. The cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word and it proves unfruitful, Mark 4, 19. Let me speak for a moment to those in midlife. Their schedule is relentless. Their career is at the point where the greatest demands are on them. Their kids engage in multiple activities and there's a time, there was a time previously when your heart was tender towards God, you wanted your life to count for him, but now your whole life is taken up with the cares of this world. The desire for other things have taken hold of your heart. The word of God has been choked out and it has become unfruitful in your life and you're losing your soul. Jesus is talking about what happens in the lives of people who hear the word. It's like a vine wrapping itself around you tighter and tighter and strangling the life out of your soul. It was once there, but now it's not. The fire has gone out. It has been strangled out by the cares of this world. Three, you can surrender your soul. Beloved, I urge you to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. 1 Peter 2.11 This would apply mostly to the young, but not only to the young. God says there are passions of the flesh and they wage war against your soul. This means passions... These passions are out to destroy your soul. And when you experience temptation towards some passion and you give yourself to it, here's what is happening. You are surrendering your soul. You are raising the white flag. You are saying to the enemy of your soul, you win, I concede, I'm yours. And he takes you captive. Think about the next time you experience temptation. The passions of the flesh are waging war against your soul. They're seeking the destruction of your soul, they're out to take your soul captive, but your soul has great value. It lasts forever. And if you surrender your soul to sin, it will be an eternal loss and you will have no one to blame but yourself. I often tell people there is no sex worth that. No sex is so good that it's worth hell for eternity. And any sex outside of marriage, that's where it will end up. And this is why the Bible commands us to flee sexual sin and lust. Maybe you can see that all three of these things are working in you and you say, I look at my life and I see them all. You've surrendered your soul to the passions of the flesh. You have strangled your soul by the cares of this world. And now your soul is starved to death. And you are no longer hungry at all for the word of God. You have no hunger for God. You have no hunger for anything that he would have for you. You are losing your soul. Every day, every week, every year, your soul is being starved, strangled, and surrendered inch by inch on its way to being lost eternally. So what can you do? 
Bishop Ryle said, the first step towards heaven is to find out the worth of your soul. And thank God you have life today to be able to deal with that. A soul that is saved is the soul that is given to Jesus Christ. And if you see the value of your soul, this is how you will respond to Jesus Christ today. You will come to Jesus and say to him, you have called me to love God with all of my heart and soul, and I haven't done that. Without you, I'm going to starve my soul, strangle my soul, and surrender my soul. I need you to be Lord, Savior, and Captain of this soul. I need you to feed my soul. I need you to guard my soul. I need you to save my soul. I need to turn my entire life, all that I am, over to you and place myself wholly into your hands. Have mercy on me, God. Give me a new heart. Take away this stony heart and give me a heart that loves you, desires you, and submits to you. Because what advantage would it be to you if you were to gain the whole world or that relationship that you can't let go of and lose your soul? There are three commandments in Mark 8 that lead up to the Lord's question. One, desire to come after me. Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me in Mark 8:34, he doesn't mean that this desire is optional. It's okay to have the desire and it's okay not to have it. Rather, this desire is a must. This one's an absolute for saving your soul. If you don't have it, then you're going to need to ask for it because it's not a negotiable desire. Jesus defines the desire as to come after me, Mark 8, 34. And by this, Jesus means that he is going somewhere and we are to go there too. He was predicting his death at that point and resurrection, followed by his ascension. He's our forerunner, according to Hebrews 6.20. He's gone on to heaven before us, and he promises that we can come after him. We will do that when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. However, we have to desire it, not run from, and not... There's a commitment that is needed to gain this, and that's an absolute. You cannot, it's not a negotiable thing. The desire must be consuming. It will not be acceptable. God won't accept half-hearted or lukewarm. He is very clear about that. Jesus says, if you desire to save your soul, you will lose it. Mark 8, 35. Jesus isn't speaking of salvation to eternal life, but of saving your soul from the pains of being a disciple. The dedication to carrying a cross. You can desire pleasure and power in this world to save your soul from suffering here. And many do that. They choose that. They want everything but to suffer for the sake of the cross. But that profits you nothing for you lose your soul in the next world. Or you can decide to bear your cross in this world so that your soul will be saved into the next. Two, deny yourself and take up your cross. The second commandment is to translate desire into commitment. Jesus says, deny yourself, take up your cross. And we all know that you must sacrifice much to gain much. That is choice by choice by choice. Make one choice to make every choice for Jesus Christ. And Jesus expects us to deny ourselves. He means dedicating yourself to him at the expense of your very soul. Lose your soul to save it. He denied himself and he carried a cross for us. Now it's our turn. And this doesn't mean that we have to give up things that are normal and needful in this life, education, career, material possessions, food, healthy activities, rest, recreation, caring about other people. But these things must be secondary and fit into his framework. They cannot be a me first life plan. We have to be consistent and constant in our dedication to Christ. The command to take up your cross in Mark 8, 34 carries the extra word in Luke's version, take up your cross daily, Luke 9, 23. The third is follow me. The third commandment gives direction to desire and dedication. Jesus says, and follow me in Mark 8, 34. Not every disciple can be a leader, but we all must follow Jesus Christ. And as Peter wrote, you were called to suffer because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps in 1 Peter 2.21.
Jesus is aware that following him is not going to be easy and there's a lot of opposition along the way. In fact, the more that you, the more, the closer you get to that, the more there is opposition and it's probably going to come from people of faith. But he says, if you are ashamed of me and my words in this sinful and adulterous generation, the son of man will in turn be ashamed of you when he comes in the glory of his father with the holy angels. It profits you nothing to follow the world. So although the journey is difficult, follow Jesus. And remember, Matthew 7, 13 and 14 says, Narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. So people want to think that most people go to heaven. But according to Jesus, that is not the case. And this is where it really sorts out. People do not want to take up their cross and follow Jesus. They want to go to heaven because they were a pretty decent person. There's no provision for that in the Bible. If we want to be popular in the eyes of others here on earth, the devil has unlimited ways to help us pursue popularity. And if you and I consider making money and accumulating material positions as our greatest goal in life, Satan has a million ways to make that happen for you. In fact, many people who prosper, who feel like they're prospering since they became a Christian, have no idea that it's actually the devil that has set them up. He has prospered them to keep them from taking up their cross and following Jesus. That is not always the case, but I have seen it happen many times where people were offered a position that they knew they probably shouldn't take, but it made them wealthy and it took them away from following Jesus. Satan has every kind of ploy that one can imagine to help us in getting all the material things we can even see. Well, people will get buildings, more houses, more storage units. They will just fill them full of stuff. And for a heart filled with covetousness, there is never a feeling of being satisfied. There is always a longing for more, 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 more. Let us be more concerned about our soul's safety forever than we are for protecting our money in the stock market or from greedy business partners or family where people take, they spend hours and hire experts to keep that every dollar protected, but they have not made provision for one second after they die. Verse 35 says we should practice by living for Jesus and not living for self. We need to die to self daily. We should use our lives to live a life of love and do good works as Ephesians 2.10 says, not for your own recognition, but for Christ's glory, live, love, mercy, and forgiveness. God will give us strength. And the truth from Jesus is very clear. If you do not shed your worldly desire, you are not following Jesus and you are not a Christian by faith. You can call yourself a Christian all day, but it is a very clear definition according to Jesus. Those who will go on to eternal life are a very specific group. The rest will not. They will forfeit it. We chase after so many different things. Only one thing is needful. Many have a fistful of dollars, a great estate, lots of prestige, and that will mean nothing when your ultimate address without Jesus is hell forever. Let's not lose our life, our soul, our meaning, chasing after that which will not last. This earth is a vapor compared to eternity, and what is important is eternity. All the struggles and benefits of this life are going to fade away. We are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and every other thing will be added to us. The Bible warns soon, and very soon, time shall be no more, and that trumpet is going to sound. We've been watching the news. Um, I don't watch like the news, but there's news that you can watch that is given an accurate reflection of what's happening in the earth. And I've never seen things lining up as quickly as they are right now for what appears to be um, setting up for the end and I know that people are afraid because they reach out to me I get multiple requests a day saying are we in the end times 
and I have been in ministry 30 years and I've never had that daily like I do now. People know that we are in the last days. And when I say the last days, back in the Bible, people thought they were in the last days. And at many different points during my life, people thought, well, we're in the last days, but this is a different, this is a whole different thing of last days than what we've ever experienced. And I don't know how people sleep at night when they're not right with God because I would be terrified right now that that trumpet was going to sound at any minute because things are really shaped up for. I tell people there's nothing right now that this world has to offer. It's being shaken very hard by God and it's going to get shaken a lot worse. There's nothing worth hanging on to right now to get this wrong. I would not gamble one more minute to hang on to something that I knew was stealing me from Jesus. It won't be worth it. This is a warning. It won't be worth it. Work for eternity. Keep your priorities right. Live holy and keep your heart open and obedient only to the will of the Father. Many are going to continue to be blinded by self-seeking and personal ambition. Many are still going to choose hell, knowing one more day, one more day, one more day, that group is going to perish. Don't be amongst them. Precious Lord, this is such a major divide for people. They don't realize the expectations to actually entering into heaven for all of eternity. It is not something you just arrive at because you lived a decent life and you went to church. There is a mandate and it is a clear one and it is a full commitment like a marriage. There are expectations of us to be eternally yours. I ask that you do whatever it takes for everyone who hears me to hear you, not me. That they would hear you. That every single choice they make from this point on would be brazen hot and they would have to literally walk away from choosing against you because it would feel like torment. I pray that you make every idol in every life that hears me tip over, fall flat on its face, make every ungodly relationship fail. Do whatever it takes, God, for everyone who hears me to abandon themselves completely to you. Thank you, Jesus, that you labored with me and that you allowed me the privilege of coming to a recognition of it's you or it's nothing. It's all you or it's nothing. You don't deserve to be treated any less. You gave all, far more than we will ever give. You deserve all. So I ask by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would sweep through everyone and burn out the sin and the desire for sin and that you will leave them full of the desire for you that they would be filled with only a desire for you that would start on a blazing fire forward, that they would chase after the King of Kings until we meet you face to face. I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.